and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. As more companies navigate the return to office movement, management teams are faced with an increased urgency of finding, training, and retaining quality talent while also creating an inclusive environment for hybrid working. It is increasingly clear that the path to long-term relevance is through leveraging human capital, but in most cases, this will require cultural changes that banks and credit unions need to win the war for talent. We are joined on the Banking Transform podcast today by Jill Nowaki, President and CEO of the financial executive search and consulting firm, Humanity and O'Rourke. Jill and I will discuss the challenges and opportunities financial institutions face today as they try to build a future-ready workplace and culture. So welcome to the show, Jill. With your long history in the credit union space, I feel we must have crossed paths in the past, but it is great to finally have you on the show today to discuss the dynamics being faced by financial institutions in the working environment. You know, before the pandemic, the largest disruptions in work and banking really involved the impact of new technologies and the growing need to build organizations that were more ready for a digital existence. But the past 18 months really elevated the importance of the physical dimension of work as well as increase the focus on the need for greater diversity within the workplace. So Jill, what are your takeaways from what is occurring week in the workplace since the pandemic? And what is your organization being asked to address as financial institutions try to become more future ready? Excellent. Thanks, Jim. And thanks so much for having me on the show. It is great to be here. It has been a fascinating time to work in workplace consulting right now. And I think the biggest takeaway I have, what's really been causing this this perspective is not because anything's changing with employees, but things are changing with people. And that's where I think sometimes we make the mistake when we're looking at Um, how to address, and whether it's strategic planning where we're going in and we're addressing consumer expectations or it's organizational consulting where we're going in and and addressing employee expectations, the, the reality is that our employees are people first. And this pandemic has changed the way people interact with the world around them, the way they regard their values and their beliefs. And that extends to not just how how we're showing up in lives outside of work, but it changes how we're showing up in lives at work too. I think it's contributed to what um, what people are willing to do in the workplace, what people expect from the level of of care and concern from their employers, and also just that general evaluation of wow, life is shorter than I thought it would be, and sometimes things happen. So I really need to make sure that I'm giving my time and choosing a path that really aligns with what I care about and what I want. And so those changes in human expectations are extending to the workplace and it's causing people to really evaluate their relationship with their company differently. And 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 it's causing companies as well to really evaluate their relationships with their, their people differently. So what we're seeing in the workplace is individuals who are expecting to have an opportunity to to work in a place that's aligned with their values, uh, to work in a place that supports who they are outside of work as well, and who understands that that the employee is not a a cog in the wheel, but a whole human who's making a choice to give some of their time there. I think that's part of the reason why we've seen the outcome of things like this great resignation that we've heard about, or we've heard that insistence on, if I can't work from home, then I'll find another job where I can in some cases. And we're... um, where we're seeing a a compulsion. I don't always think this is by choice, but we've seen a lot of women have to leave the workplace because of uh, family care obligations. And again, that goes back to that that balance and that weighting of what matters most to me and then making decisions from there. Now, now I'm going to ask you a question that I don't know if anybody even has the answer for, but we're, we're in a very, very fluid situation right now. We have some organizations coming back to work. Some have already done so. Some are still working in an environment that you can be hybrid. Some are not allowing hybrid work. And there's even now the discussion around some organizations requiring vaccination of employees. When you look at this, how do you see what you believe is going to be the landing point or what you think might be at least a a tentative landing point for how hybrid work itself is going to be handled right now? 
I think that's a great question. And fluidity is an absolutely accurate word to describe the the situation. And, you know, as we're watching COVID variants come in too, I think people sort of start to think they've found this new normal and then that gets disrupted again with with new ideas and new thoughts. I do believe that the the ultimate landing point will be a place where remote work is normal in the workplace. I also believe though that organizations are going to find themselves in a situation where they really have to address the equity of remote work before they really find where their landing spot is in their organization. So for example, I have a a lot of clients who have told me with pride or a lot of contacts I have in the industry who've told me with pride, well, this remote work really worked for us. We've seen our employees be more productive. And so we're going to a complete um, remote work environment and everybody's going to have the chance to work remotely. And then we talk about the tellers and they say, well, no, 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 not the tellers. The tellers have to come in still. And the reality is those tellers are looking at it and saying, wait, so I was an essential employee during the pandemic. I had to be here, even if it jeopardized my health and my well-being. I still have to commute to work. So there's expenses that are associated with that, maintaining my car, buying the gas for it. I'm still the lowest paid employee in the organization. And I'm the one who still in this situation has to come in and be there while other people get the flexibility of being able to to work in their slippers. And then they compare that to some of the other roles that are out there where, you know, for other other companies and other jobs, there are entry level positions that can be done from home. So we're seeing organizations watch some of their employees um, be object to the, well, I don't like the fact that because this is my title or this is my place in the org chart that I don't have that same flexibility. And I think organizations are looking at that and saying, okay, you know, maybe some of them did hazard pay at the beginning of of COVID to to pay up a little bit for those people who had to come in. But what's the long-term sustainable version of of hazard pay? Is it increasing wage for those employees? Is it providing some other type of benefit that makes it more appealing to come into the office? And, um, or is it just an acceptance that, that you may have employees who are frontline workers today who are really vying for those back office positions every time they open so that they have that that flexibility. And I think that's an important co- uh, point to focus on is I don't think it's necessarily that 100% of employees want to be remote workers. I think what it is, is that if given the choice in anything in life to be told, well, you can either be told what has to happen to you, or you can be told that you have flexibility to make the choice. Most humans are going to say, well, give me the opportunity to make the choice for myself instead of have somebody else tell me what I have to do. So in those companies where flexibility is offered to some, but not all, I think that the the evaluation of the equity of that situation is, is going to come out and it's going to matter. Well, let's take the opposite side of that then. So, you know, we, we view, um, at least based on the last 18 months, that remote work, availability of remote work is a good thing. However, there's more and more discussion recently that people that work in the traditional workplace may view those people that cannot or have decided not to come in and work in a hybrid world could actually be viewed in some way as a secondary employee, or maybe they won't be given the same opportunity for advancement. And taking that a step further, could this end up being a segmentation that really works against women and, and what I'm going to call the lower wage employee that can't get the, the health care, the daycare for being able to come into work. Because right now we're in a transition phase. We're not sure where this is going to all land. But right now, many people don't have the choice because, you know, uh, daycare facilities aren't open and daycare people aren't, aren't working yet. So do we have a possibility that there's actually going to be a bias against these employees that are in a hybrid environment or that we actually automatically segment a group of people in a, into a secondary position. That's absolutely a challenge. Mm-hmm. And uh, so part of the the work that we do in diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting is we will do voice of the employee research. Well, we'll go into organizations and talk to every employee at that organization. And it's a perhaps surprising trend, but when we're talking about that idea of how inclusive is your workplace, we hear a lot from employees who are 
um, remote or working in in other areas. And in credit unions, we've heard this a lot from, well, if you're in the administrative building, you get treated one way. But if you're out at a satellite branch, you get treated another. Yeah. We see that extend through too with remote employees where, well, if you're in the office, then the CEO might stop by and just chat with you or check in with you. Uh, but if you're at home, you might get forgotten. And early on in the pandemic, I was... Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who works for a large corporation, and I was saying there's this really interesting concept about how managers need to be more aware of their of the equity in this situation. Because so often as a leader, when now our team is spread out, we might have one person on our team who we identify most with, and that might be our go-to person. So we float every idea past that person. We call that person. In the office, we might not notice we're doing that because we have those in. We have those team meetings. We have people coming together. We have employees stopping by and just having that casual sort of water cooler conversation. But when we're now remote, we have to be intentional about those connections. And so I was talking to this friend of mine about this a senior executive at a large corporation. And he said, gosh, that's interesting. It occurs to me that in the eight months since this pandemic has started, or that I think it was 10 weeks, 10 weeks since this pandemic has started, I have not spoken to my manager one time. That over that much time period, that person had never checked in, never called. And so he said, we didn't have a great relationship before the pandemic. There were other people on the team that that person was more friendly with, but we were at least seeing each other every day. And now it's almost this out of sight, out of mind concept. So when we extend that out to, well, what does that do to someone's you know, long-term prospect for advancement or for consideration? Well, if you are not being invited to participate in the work groups, if you're not being asked to share your opinion, if you aren't having those opportunities to, to connect and weigh in, then you don't get considered for that next promotion. You do get forgotten. You do get overlooked. Another uh, concept I hear about a lot related to this kind of remote employees not being as engaged or included is that sometimes, and this extends as well to people who might have parenting responsibilities too, sometimes as leaders, we make the choice for the employee based on what we think. So we have an opportunity to travel right. to a conference that comes up and we might say, well, I'll invite this employee to go, but I can't imagine this one wants to because they have caregiving responsibilities or they have, um, you know, they, they don't, they don't work from the office, they work from home, so they can't really travel from this situation. And that's another challenge that comes with, with that remote disconnect that can sometimes happen is that we might make the decision for the employee about how present or available they are instead of really giving them that same opportunity to engage fully. And without question, opportunities for promotion, for advancement, for more work projects, those come with with being involved in in other work and in, in that connection with a with a manager or a leader. Visibility matters in those considerations. Yeah. So I mean it's the informal visibility as well as the formal visibility. And as you said, there could be a whole different set. And and what's difficult is we take so many of the work environment components for granted. We don't even know we build in these biases and that we view one person differently than another, one division differently than another. As you said, it even happened within buildings when you when an organization had multiple buildings involved. How does an organization deal with this subtle bias that may get created that we don't even know we're doing? And what are some examples of how you've seen organizations done doing well with building teams, engaging maybe across departments that are not the they're not in the normal day to day engagement, and even with onboarding new employees? Because my son just graduated from college, all his friends graduated last year, and he has said that the biggest difference he sees between people that are working for organizations is how badly and sometimes well they've onboarded new employees in this remote environment. How, you know, number one, how do we work with these things? How do you work with organizations to, to get rid of these walls that we build up that we don't even know? But even, are there some examples of organizations you've seen, they've really done yeah. it pretty well? So lots of questions in there with a couple of different <laughs> approaches. Yeah, no, that's okay, but I'm all, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about all of the areas. So the, the concept around a bias in the workplace is, is a tricky one because 
nobody wants to be told, well, you have biases. But the reality is we all do. And they're not all bad. Sometimes yeah. this, um, you know, the, the biases we have, they come in because they give us a chance to you know, make quick reactions and use information we already have in order to process decisions and act. If every time we were hungry, we were faced with a consideration of looking around at what's around us and trying to determine what we should put in our mouth instead of having a bias toward food as something that we would do, uh, you know, we would waste a lot of time and there's only so much time in the day. So those biases can help us. The problem is when those biases might be informed by something other than what's actually going on in the situation and causes us to react or behave in a way that that may not make sense and we don't understand we're doing it. So the some of the areas there, we, we will never be able to stop having biases. But if we can find those ways to interrupt the reactions we have to our biases in a manner that is... Um, you know, less about instinct and gut and more about actually, you know, practically moving through something, then we can move forward. So by that, I mean, for example, um, and this is an interesting one. If, if any, you know, if, if my, uh, my career has been one where I was able to advance and, and become the first female CEO in my last organization's history. So from that perspective, someone might say, wow, you know, Jill really cares about advancing women in the workplace. A lot of the writing I've done, a lot of the research I've done has come from that. Well, Harvard has this implicit association test and it tests different sorts of, of implicit bias. And I took the one on, on race and was pretty proud of myself for having no detectable bias. And then I took the one on women and found that I have a significant bias against women in the workplace, which is something that, that would not necessarily make sense. But going back to that concept of interrupting that bias. So if I recognize that there may be times when I may be quick to say, well, that employee has children at home, so I'm not going to ask her if she wants to go to that overnight conference. If I can, I can pause that and say, "Am I? Is that actually because of something she said, or is that because of of me?" Um, that's helpful. If I can't, if that bias is so strong that I can't pause and ask myself that question, or I don't know about it, what can be helpful instead is having processes in place for something. So when it when an opportunity to go to a conference comes up, do we have a universal approach to inviting people to participate or choose to go or applying to go for that. If um, if I'm looking at spending, you know, am I tracking the amount of time I'm spending informally or personally with all of my employees to determine if I do have a tendency to have a go-to person in the organization rather than really equitably asking for input and spending time with employees? We recognize as well, that even things like performance reviews. So there's studies that show that um, women are less likely to get constructive, actionable feedback from male managers. So a, a male manager is more comfortable telling another man, hey, you got to do this different. You got to do this different. So might give a more polite performance review to a female employee, but that's not particularly helpful because if I'm told I'm doing fine, then maybe I won't change anything that would get me to do excellent. But if I'm told I could improve in these specific areas, then I may actually take that next step and grow my career. So that's just another place where if an organization can say, all right, here's how we deliver performance reviews. Here's how much time we spend with our employees in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Here's the specific steps we take to move through that. Putting those processes in place can, can help to mitigate those biases because now it's not about what I instinctively do. It's about following a system that's consistent for everyone in the organization. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you brought up subtly in the last answer quite a bit that really the need to measure um, satisfaction of employees, how well or people can do as far as building biases or breaking down biases. Is this more important than ever, especially since we're going to have a brand new subset within every organization around those who may be at home, those who aren't at home? And, and is the measurement now more than ever going to be important and then actually taking action on that? 
I think so. I, and I think the other element to it is that we can find that data. So we can, we can, we have the ability to measure these touch points and what we're doing with it. And I think there's just a generally increased awareness. Um, you know, you talk to a lot of people about data and analytics. I think there's an increased awareness about like, whoa, we have information we should use this in a meaningful way. And we've done that a lot externally yeah. more recently. Yeah, we we sometimes we some you know, we we ask to be measured and then we don't really, really want right. the answers. And then even less, you know, and, and as we've seen across all organizations with everything having to do with change, people really don't want to change. You know, so it's it's those organizations that have the leadership that can embrace what those results may be and actually say, I'm not going to discount them and go, well, that's those, that's just those people that say that and say, geez, there's a subset here that's very identifiable that we probably have to change yeah. something. I think that's absolutely yeah. right, Jim. I think it's that people say, oh, well, yes, They're like, give me the data, please measure this. And, and there's some hope that the data is going to confirm that we're doing everything right. And when the data comes back and says, oh, here are some places to change. There is that kind of, well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to do anything different. Uh, another quote that I've heard recently is people love change, but they don't love to change. And that, that to me is also. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and no, there's been no better examples than over the last 18 months. You know, you know, I, I remember back in March of last year telling people, this is going to be the greatest opportunity we've ever had to reassess what we're doing in life, if we're happy with what we're doing in life, and we're going to be given time. We think, you know, at that time, I thought six months, we're going to begin given time to re-educate ourselves into where we want to go and actually go there. Well, as people look back now, and it's 18 months or more, and you look back and, and there's a lot of people, I think, that are going to say, I really wasted a lot of time in being able to, to truly embrace a lot of things that I really wanted to move towards. So, you know, it, again, it's going to be a matter of uh, not only what does the measurement say, but are you willing to take action on that measurement? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's probably a bit of human nature on anything, not just in the workplace, but but anywhere for this um, this concept of, oh, I want to do this and then not taking action right away and putting it off and saying, well, I missed this opportunity to act. And that's that when we're talking about things like, you know, creating a workplace that works for employees, or we're talking about things like making this adjustment to remote work. What we're seeing right now in a talent attraction side mm -hmm. is that the war for, for talent is really tight. It's hard to find candidates right now. And so if employers are out there saying, well, we missed this opportunity to really make our organization, you know, work for our team during COVID. So I guess we'll just, this is our life now. And I guess we'll just stay here. Then, um, then they're not going to position themselves for whatever this next wave of change is too. So that would be my, I guess my response on that is it's never too late to, to change, but but definitely a huge um, critical juncture over that last 18 months where it was the change you make today, people might be more willing to accept because of the absolute necessity of it too. You know, Jill, one of the major themes coming out of the last 18 months was the realization that many industries have a long way to go when it comes to diversity and inclusion. The banking industry has lagged in so many ways in this area, both at lower levels, but most importantly in leadership ranks and boardrooms. You know, this is going to be a big question again. What needs to be done to improve in this area? And, and more importantly, we, we kind of know what needs to be done. How do we do it? Right. That's, that's the biggest part of that question, right? I think that uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I started the firm when I did was because I was I was working as a trade association CEO and I'd help my member credit unions through their strategic planning. And it would feel like so often there was this conversation around, you know, we need to add some diversity to our board of directors. We need to add some diversity to our leadership team. And, and then the next year we'd go back and we'd have the same conversation with the same people or at least the same demographics at the table. And it was a, it was a something where for so long, I thought somebody really has to do something about this. And after enough time, I thought, well, I'm someone and I can do something. I can go in and look at that. But it is a, you know, the approach to it is that when we're talking about diversifying an organization, we're talking about people. And so many financial institutions 
I, that I was working with would talk about how people were their most important asset. But when it came to strategic planning around that, the conversation never really went to the people. So one of the examples I use sometimes I work with, I was working with a, a credit union that was talking about how important their technology strategy was and that their entire emphasis was going to be on technology. They were going to reinvent the way they were serving digitally. And when we looked at their org chart, they hadn't updated any sort of section of the IT department since 2005. And well, if if you're a financial institution who hasn't changed the way you look at technology and digital delivery since 2005, you haven't done anything since before the iPhone was invented. So that's a, that is not going to make you a leader in technology. And it's not at that point about the technology. It's about bringing in the people who might be able to drive that change in a way. And so that's an example that's pretty pretty tactical and pretty neutral from that side of it. It's a, there's nothing emotional about that one. But once we start talking about needing to change the demographics so that our team is not just knowledgeable about the functional or technical work we're doing, but knowledgeable about the people we're trying to serve as well, and knowledgeable about the fact that our our target members have different experience, different expectations, different ideas of what they need. And to serve them well, we need to have people that understand those that target membership in our strategic decision-making of the organization. So for example, if you have a board of directors that's comprised entirely of uh, affluent people whose consumer behavior is most likely to be long-term saving, and you have a target audience of lower income individuals whose primary financial behavior is um, transactional or and you ask the, strate- the the team of strategic decision makers what to do for a product they might spend a lot of time talking about what the rate of the hundred thousand dollar five-year certificate of deposit should be that is not something that your uh, lower income consumers cares about when the average American doesn't even have Four hundred dollars in a savings account. So that that type of concept of bring in somebody who actually matches the the audience that you're trying to serve, that will be something that will will change everything else. When the people change, the decisions make change, the products change, and the results change from that. You know, it's interesting. The the elephant in the room, and and not to the analogy is a little bit too too significant, but you know, most mid sized organizations, um, middle market organizations, are are their leadership is based on people that came up through the ranks. They played golf together as management trainees. They're white males, um, and there's very little diversity of thought or of the demographics, as you said. What do organizations have to do to make sure that not only their leadership rank, but their boards start to reflect the marketplace in general, where you not only have racial diversity, but but gender diversity? Um, you already brought up technology diversity, where you know it, the last thing you want to do is hire more people like me, but just of a different color or different, you know, a different gender and end up with nobody that has any skills in the areas that you're trying to go as an organization. How do you embrace that? Do you go outside the industry? I mean, especially now when when it's so hard to find people and there's so much, I mean, we're just seeing, we're seeing the fintechs fighting each other for talent. We see, you know, a person from AWS going to, to Goldman to yesterday and we see that Chase and Citibank are, are switching off employees and there's a lot of man. What, do we, what does an organization have to do? And one more and question is, is the ability to partner with third party providers helping somebody? Yeah. So one of the thoughts that immediately comes to mind, and, and it's probably spurred by the comment of, of playing golf together. So it is absolutely, you know, leaders care about their businesses. They care about their organizations. They care about the work they do. They want to work with people they trust. And so that's why so often when we're looking to fill a position on our team for a critical role, we look to someone we know. So that person we play golf with, we trust them already. We want to bring them into our team because of that. The challenge is that there's a study that shows that 75% of white people only know, have other white people in their, their network of people who they talk to about things that matter. So careers are, are absolutely an example of, of something that matters. 
So in the case of the credit union industry, just a quick statistically, 90% of credit union CEOs are white and 90% of board members are white. So if if 75%... And I, I would say it was it's probably close to the same with regard to male versus female uh, too. It, I mean, maybe a little bit better, but, it, yes. but if you get in the banking industry as opposed yes. to credit union industry, you probably even see a more That's male absolutely bias. Absolutely true. I'm so, just... and in and in the credit union industry, we do um, we do often talk about how we do have more female CEOs. But when we look at the asset size, we are very reflective of uh, similar to the banking industry. Right. So, once we get to institutions over a billion dollars in assets, eighty five percent of those CEOs are male. So, it is, it, it, and that is the case of that that um, in the banking industry as well, I think. But the challenge there is, so if, if the people, you know, are the ones you tap into and you only know other people like yourself, it is, it makes it hard to expand that. And, and that's not the case just with executives. That's the case with boards too. Most of most board recruiting strategies are that the current board recruits others to join the board with them. And so you absolutely need to find a way, again, we're going back to that, like interrupt that cycle. So how do you either expand your network or expand the the pool that you're considering when you're adding to it beyond just who you know? Uh, and that's where absolutely a, a partner, a, you know, a third party partner, somebody outside of your immediate um, circle is going to help with that because they may have a, a different network than you do. They may have different resources than you do. We really encourage with, you know, we work with clients on recruiting, but we also encourage partnerships with other organizations that serve the the target membership that the client serves to go out and do this research. So if you're looking to try to um just for the for the sake of this, let's say if if you are looking to attract more black leaders to your executive team, in the credit union space, it makes a lot of sense to go to the African American Credit Union Coalition and work with them on reaching that membership as you're attracting talent and bringing them in. Because again, an example of a group that serves that that target audience you want to reach, and building a meaningful partnership there that helps to to share access to that could definitely help to create opportunities for expanded diversity. It's um. It is an interesting, you know, you referenced how tight the talent market is right now, and it is absolutely a, a job seekers uh, work out there. We talk sometimes about how, like in housing, you can have a buyer's market or a seller's market. Well, employment right now, we definitely have an employee's market. And so decisions do, I think there's an urgency to the decision-making and hiring right now. And one of the um, one of the challenges there is fast hiring happens when we hire people we know, because we already have them, they're already vetted. But if we only know people who like who are like us, we may have to take a bit of a pause, do the time to expand that pool that we have to consider to select from before we make a decision. So that um, for, for organizations, even if they don't have open positions right now, starting to build out those networks, build out those partnerships so that when an opening comes up, they can have access to that that network right away can help to move to make that diversity hiring go more quickly when the time comes later too. I, I would imagine that's where a third party organizations such as Humanity and Aurora come in also that they can really help along the line of expanding who you look at, ex- finding ways that you've seen work to get the diversity and to even force the issue of saying, you know, guys, I, look around, look at the people at this table that are, that are engaged with me right now. They all look the same. We need to bring some challenges there. And it's interesting because I, I, one of the organizations I met with um, recently was uh, Cambridge Savings Bank. And they have uh, a new leader that's come in to really take on so many different roles, but she came out of the healthcare industry and she was she's in charge of customer experience she's built their new digital uh, app and and all these other things and i said you know it's amazing you were brought in i think it was february of last year where's your, your her leader was there her president was there and I, I i said congratulations i said to embrace the ability to say i need somebody outside the industry to look at this and to do so with a female i said in an organization that is probably a lot of it is is male based is a real embracing of change, which I talk about a lot. And it's difficult because you're putting yourself out there. You're going to put her out there. 
but it's working so well and it's great to see these success stories. So when you look at those challenges and opportunities, Jill, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see as organizations work on human capital planning, succession, and leadership development? I think that the the biggest challenge for it can be making sure it stays a top priority. So it is it is so easy to treat this like a, a nice to have rather than a need to have when everything else starts to bog us down. But if we get this right, if we get the leadership development, the human capital planning right, then we have the people there to make everything else work. So it reminds me a bit of this concept of, um, you know, we, we when there's there was concern that the machines would take over, right? And it's, uh, you know, are we going to end up, you know, automating so right. much that we don't even need people anymore? And I think that the the reality is that pe- people who are paying attention to the workforce understand that the need for people never goes away. The need for people to do different things just changes. And so, as we continue to look at at you know jobs transitioning and it becomes more of uh you know we're we're trying to get employees who who have you know are good at how to think rather than what to think and we're bringing them in and we need those people who can use mm-hmm. use good judgment and, and make more strategic decisions instead of just follow processes and procedures that the critical you know, it is much more critical to be making sure that the leadership development, the training, the onboarding, the integration of people is done right so that they can be in that place where they're empowered to to carry out the more sophisticated roles that the humans have to serve in our organizations. And when leaders remember that and keep that front and center on the priority, then then that's the biggest, I guess, I guess leaders not remembering that or not keeping that front and center is the biggest challenge. It's the prioritization of time. And when it comes down to it and we say, well, that's nice to have, but right now we've got to get these transactions handled. We miss out on the opportunity to make sure that we're really positioned for whatever kind of growth is there. Automation is possible with so much of what we do, but we still need the right people there to be interfacing with that and to carrying it out. And sometimes I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, where an organization might say, all right, our strategic initiative is we are really going to improve and update our technology. But you've got to think about the people that are using that technology, running that technology, served by that technology, and make sure you get the right people there to carry that technology forward, which sounds like what the the example you just gave, they brought in this person who would look differently at that and make sure they brought it forward. So making sure that, that the time is being spent, not just looking at the experience someone brings, but really how does this person think? What can they add to the team that's maybe not there right now? And making that part of the critical decision making criteria for for hiring someone to be, how is this going to add value to the thought process that we have in the organization right now? How is this going to help us change the way we think, not just what we think as we move forward? You know, that's amazing. I talk about often the what I call the seven components of digital transformation. And we talk about the cust- improving the customer experience. We talk about what I always say is the foundational element of data and analytics. If you don't get data and analytics right, nothing else works. Talk about innovation. I talk about fixing the back office processes, in a, building into technology and buying the technology. I talk about the leadership and cultural issues. And I also talk about the need to upgrade and give more attention towards talent. It is very clear after this conversation that when I talk about the foundation of data analytics, the reality is even more foundational there is you got to get the people part right. Um, We do not have the people in most organizations that are ready for the digital future. We don't have the diversity that's needed to build a diverse environment that is inclusionary and is community-based. And I mean community-based being whatever your community may be, even a big organization has their communities, but we need to upgrade our talent. We need to focus on what, in, in, during a break, we talked about the fact that this can be seen as the soft part of the business, but the bottom line, if you get this wrong, nothing else happens well, and you can't buy yourself out of it. In much the same way, you can't buy technology to fill up all the gaps, because if you don't implement it right, and if you don't have the right talent, you can't do it. Most importantly, 
if you don't give the attention to your employees, let them know that not only are they important, but they're imperative and that we will all fail. And I think, you know, what's interesting, I think I think financial institutions have done a, a, a really poor job of letting employees know that even though we're moving from what I'll call an analog um, based business to a digital based business, that there's still a place for every one of them as long as they're willing to change. But we've got to give them the springboard. We've got to give them the training. We have to realize, you know, I talk about the fact that people in the branches, yes, your transactions have gone down 60% more since COVID, but the reality is we can deploy insights and analytics to you that will allow you to reach out to consumers that you used to work with, members and customers they used to work with and help them move down their financial journey with solutions that we can provide insight into how it can work. There's still a place for everybody and very much like retail where my wife worked from moved from store retail to digital retail and immediately she became the enemy because people said you're taking business away from us and we and they had to rethink what is the way we deliver retail so i think you know from your conversation with me it's very clear that organizations have to double down on their commitment to employees what roles they have to play, how we educate and train people, but most importantly, how we build for the future. Because we to become future ready is going to need the right people. And you know, I, I when you were speaking in the last section, I, I thought about the fact that look at the competition that's going after top talent between organizations that we already have high respect for doing it pretty well. The Chase's, the Bank of America's, the Citibank, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the, the, the Apples. These organizations are stealing people, stealing leaders from each other. In fact, in Walmart's case, they stole leaders that were already working on their account with regard to the organization they were working for. This is happening for a reason. It's because organizations that are ahead of the game realize we can't stay ahead of the game without the right people in place. This goes from top to bottom. So, you know, Jill, great having you on the show today. How do listeners reach out to you directly and your company with regard to really building the future of capital, plan, human capital planning and leadership? Yeah, development? excellent. Email is definitely the best way to reach us. Uh, so we have the, I can be reached directly at my email address, which is just jill at humanity.com. Um, or also we have a, a website that uh, details more of the work that we do. And that's that uh, can be found at humanity.com. So humanity is H-U-M-A-N-I-D-E-I.com. Jill. It's been a pleasure. It's been, it, it, we took way too long to get together. I'm glad we had time. Thank to do you it so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, Ray's a top five banking podcast. I generally appreciate the support you've provided since we started this endeavor. If you enjoy what we're doing, please be sure to follow Banking Transform on your favorite podcast app. Also, please give us a review and give some love so that we can get better speakers and listeners for the show. Finally, be sure to catch my most recent articles on the financial brand and check out the research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcasts. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roe Hoffman, and video engineer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, a diverse mix of voices leads to better discussions, decisions, and outcomes for everyone.